Hello, good morning, or good afternoon, I should say. My name is Andres Martinez. I am the uh, editorial director here at Future Tense and a professor of practice at the Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. Um, really glad you could all join us, and apologies that we're starting a few minutes late. Um, our food delivery was, was delayed today, so we wanted to give people a chance to, to grab something beforehand. But we do want to get started. Uh, briefly, Future Tense, uh, for those of you who have not been with us before, is a partnership between New America, Slate Magazine, and Arizona State University. We, we publish content daily on Slate's website, and we like coming together in person to have events like today's. Uh, we had a great event last week on Who's Afraid of Online Speech. We have a movie coming up soon, uh, so you can follow us at Future Tense now. We're really uh, delighted today to also be sharing um, the organization of this event and co-sponsoring it, um, having it co-sponsored by Tech Congress, which is a project uh, here of uh, OTI, the Open Technology Institute. Tech Congress is an organization that has created a Congressional Innovation Fellowship, bringing diverse tech talent, ideas, and training to Congress uh, to build a, pra a practical and pragmatic understanding of Washington within the tech industry and vice versa. So the mission of Tech Congress is very much aligned with our broader subject today. So we're thrilled to be doing this with, with Tech Congress. And I also wanted to uh, give a shout out and credit one of my colleagues at, at Arizona State University, Dave Gustin, who directs the School for the Future of Innovation and Society, who really is sort of the, uh, one of the co-conspirators of, of today's event in, in bringing it uh, together and unfortunately had a last minute issue um, arise back in Arizona which is preventing him from being here with us but I do want to to credit him and his sort of intellectual authorship of of today's subject. Uh, quickly on the housekeeping front please remember to silence your cell phones. This is being live streamed so <laughs> when we have Q&A's if you could wait for a microphone uh, when a moderator um, uh, calls on you, and if you could introduce yourself, that's always nice as well. So without any further ado, given our time constraints, I am really thrilled to welcome onto the stage to give some opening remarks on what we're calling the crisis of expertise, another key co-conspirator co in terms of bringing, it's, it's sort of weird to talk about co-conspirators these days in Washington, so <laughs> maybe I, I, should, I should stop using that phrase. But um, Sheila Jasanoff, we're, we're really thrilled that you helped us conceive of this event and uh, are going to uh, get us started with some opening remarks. Sheila is a Forsheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. She's the founder and director of the program on science, technology, and society at Harvard. Um, at the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, she was the founder of the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Cornell University as well. And Sheila is one of the, the great minds in our country in terms of this interplay of policy, science, and technology, which is what uh, Future Tense is all about. So we're thrilled to have you, Sheila. Thank you. First of all, Andres, thank you for that kind introduction, and I'd like to offer my own small shout out to Dave Gustin, because uh, this was uh, not co-conspiracy, co-laboration, that means so collaborators all the way down, and therefore it's also not an occasion for great minds or monopolies or anything of that sort. I think that the title of what our democracies need to know is um, an invitation to think broadly about the topic that brings us together, crisis of expertise. Well, I mean, there's a level at which to understand the crisis of expertise that would say, damn right, expertise ought to be in crisis because it is a kind of thing that has set itself apart from what ordinary people know and what ordinary people care about. And maybe this is one of those you know, generational corrections such that expertise is forced to account for itself in a more plausible way. And one of the things that our democracies might need to know is um, a better explanation for why 
uh, this group of people who call themselves experts deserve credence, respect, a special status at all. So in a sense, I see this occasion and a number of other occasions of this sort that I've been present at as a great self-corrective moment in democracy. It's not that we should give up hope and expertise at all, but we should think more deeply about what it is that allows some people to claim that they should be allowed to know for the many. Uh, in democratic thought, we've thought forever and ever about why some people should be allowed to govern for the many, and we keep thinking about it all the time. We have elections every two years, four years, whatever, and we think about it then. But with expertise, we haven't done the same kind of thinking. So Andres has already pointed out that this is a collaboration in many respects. There are different agencies and different interests involved here. And so I don't want to occupy too much time right now. I want to say that there are at least three or four different strands of thought about the notion of expertise in public life that I think you will be hearing about and hearing from. So first of all, there is a set of questions about what kinds of knowledge uh, it is important for us to generate collectively and to accept that we should be doing this. I mean, so is it a public good theory of knowledge that these are uh, kinds of things that people would not produce left to their own devices. Much of the information that we have, for instance, about toxic pollutants in the country, nobody would have gone about generating it if there had not been some impetus to generate it, and yet we all benefit from knowing that kind of thing. So some sort of, some set of reflections on um, the kinds of expertise where we all benefit even though nobody has a very specific interest in generating that kind of knowledge. How is it that we can make sure that that knowledge is there? So I think that is one thread that you'll be hearing about this afternoon. Another thread is about the special role of the federal government, particularly in the era of big data, in being a repository and a source of data collection, and why and how we depend on that, why and how it is important to maintain that capability and uh, what we can do to make that capability better understood and uh, respected and accepted by um, people in the society because without their buy-in, we would not be able to maintain that capability. Uh, it's often said that America got founded in part on the commitment to producing uh, collective knowledge. Uh, when President Clinton unveiled the map of the human genome, he called attention to the fact that in that very room, Thomas Jefferson had unveiled the first map of the United States of America. So those are examples of public knowledge being created by the federal government with its involvement, but also that you need a political uh, uh, manifestation of the legitimacy of that knowledge in order to secure the kind of democratic buy-in that you need for that knowledge to be accepted and relied upon. Um, another strand I think that we will hear about is what about uncertainty, ignorance, and decision making, and what do we do as democracies when there is a need to move forward but there isn't definitive knowledge. To what extent do we rely on experts? To what extent do we rely on citizens? What is the right relationship between citizens and experts? And what about institutions that we may not think about immediately, such as our public museums in mediating uh, those sets of relationships between citizens and experts? How do we produce public institutions that, that sit at the interface between common knowledge and expert knowledge. And of course, I work in a university where I'm daily aware of the fact that one of the products we produce is citizens. So I'm hoping that that strand of discussion, how do citizens relate to experts under conditions of imperfect knowledge or still fluid knowledge, that that will be another of the themes that we'll address. So I'll leave it right here. We have very distinguished speakers representing these various themes, and I'm looking forward to learning a great deal from the afternoon. Thank you, Sheila. And Sheila, I should mention, will be in one of the, the subsequent conversations. So 
Uh, <coughs> we will hear more from Sheila. Uh, now I just want to welcome up uh, the moderator for our next conversation is David uh, Leonhardt. Um, I've known uh, David for a long time. Uh, I knew him when he was young at the New York Times, and he was very wise even back then. He is the op an op-ed columnist, as, as I'm sure most of you know, and the associate editorial page editor at the New York Times. Um, and David will introduce the speakers in the next conversation. Um, I should say I was teasing David the other day that he's, he, was, he's, he was waiting by his phone, hoping he'd be called to moderate some think tank event, because the news these days is so slow, there's nothing going on in DC. <laughs> so I'm glad we could give you an opportunity to do something and I productive. Are, are, are these on? Are we good? Uh, I responded that actually I, I was thrilled to have an opportunity to not talk about the news <laughs> for at least one hour. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be back here. Um, uh, I, of course, am up here with Cecilia Munoz, um, who is the former head of President Obama's Domestic Policy Council uh, and is currently the Vice President of Policy and Technology right here at New America, as well as the director of the New America National Network. Hello, Cecilia. And Sylvia Matthews Burwell, who, was, who ran both the Office of Management and Budget and um, the Department of Health and Human Services in the Obama administration and is currently the president of American University. This being Washington, a relatively small town, I actually met Sylvia, um, I don't know, five or six years ago at the bottom of a slide while we were both waiting for our small children to come hurtling out of it. <laughs> um, uh, so we want to talk, we're talking about the crisis of knowledge and expertise, and I think we, we, we want to separate, we're going to talk for a few minutes, and then we're going to open it up to questions from you all. And I think we want to separate this into two different parts here. Um, and in the first part, we're going to talk about the elephant in the room, and in the second part, we're not. Um, and uh, I think the elephant in the room is the sort of crisis of, of doubt in this country about expertise and knowledge. Um, the fact that people have lost faith in nearly every institution that exists, whether it's the media, whether it's Congress, whether it's the healthcare system, um, whether it's organized religion, organized labor, big business. Um, and what we might be able to do to try to deal with that situation. Because if we can't even agree about what the facts are and what knowledge is, and we think one expert is no different from uh, anyone else, um, it creates a real problem for our democracy. Um, so I want to start there, which obviously gets to the heart of some of the partisan polarization we have, and then we're going to get into some stuff that takes us away from partisan polarization. Sylvia, I'll start with you. So I think as we think about uh, the question of, I think it's important to understand how we got here, and I think Sheila touched upon some of the things, and you just did in terms of saying, is it that we're at this place where people don't trust experts or sources of knowledge? Is that because of a trust issue? Is it because of a time issue in terms of they don't have time, they, they don't know how to access? And I think that's one of the questions as we go about this that we need to think through. And I will use an example near and dear to my heart, which is healthcare. And when one starts to have the conversation about the substance, and I'll use a very specific example that is not a partisan example, um, because it's something everybody agrees on, and that's the issue of pre-existing conditions and the coverage of pre-existing conditions. And so there was a lack of knowledge that in a period before a piece of legislation, those were not covered, and that then they were covered. But when education went about to help people understand that pre-existing conditions were something that would no longer be covered, that the law did that. And you used lots of different tools to do that, but that's something that took. People actually wanted that knowledge. They heard that knowledge. The question of what resources they heard it from you had to do that very broadly, and that gets to the trust issue. So I think this question of why is it that people don't want the knowledge? Is it because of trust of experts? Is it about time and not being able to access it appropriately? Is it about the sources that they're getting? If you gave them the right sources, if they had other sources, would they do it? And so as we try and resolve the issue for the democracy, I think getting to the core of is it different groups of people that have different feelings about this? To get to a solution, understand how we got to where we are. Almost take the big and make it smaller, bring it down to people's level. Yes, and understand why is it that they don't, uh, why is it that people don't want to hear from experts? Is it that they don't want to hear from experts or they don't want to hear from those experts? Or is it a trust issue or is it it's not accessible? Having been a person in policy, I can tell you, you know, trying to make 
very sometimes like Ebola. We can talk about that in a little bit in terms of the questions of communication around that, what you know and what you don't know. Um, that becomes difficult. So is the problem we're not doing it right? Is the problem who's doing it? Uh, or that people don't want it? Yeah. Cecilia. I would just add to that that I think part of the problem is that we're in an environment where there is hostility to knowledge. Um, in particular with respect to policy making, that's sort of a new and unprecedented thing. And as you know, noted, if we're unable to agree on sort of what the underlying facts are of a situation, it becomes really hard to have a debate about how to resolve a situation. I mean, at some level, I, because this is, feels real, pretty new and pretty extraordinary, I don't think we have answers, but I do think it's important to be sort of relentless about putting knowledge into people's hands and, and giving people the capacity to develop expertise themselves rather in addition to relying on people who have spent lifetime studying an issue. And so some of that is about making sure that folks have access to data that you, that, um, you know, people who act as advocates in addition to sort of amassing knowledge and presenting a case um, democratize the ability for others to present the case. And uh, just to give you a quick example, I am sadly old enough to remember the first time that the census actually counted Latinos with any accuracy for the first time. That was the 1980 census. Wow. And I worked at a Latino civil rights organization, which was for the first time had numbers to actually, that allowed us to demonstrate what we knew because we were living it. We suspected there were high poverty rates. We suspected there was low educational attainment. But we didn't know because there wasn't census data. Um, so by essentially a bunch of you know, policy nerds crunching numbers, putting it in people's hands, we began to formulate a policy agenda on the basis of some evidence that was corroborated by our own experience. And ultimately, that becomes the basis for a policy agenda being and none of us had particularly special expertise. This was just something that we cared about. There's no reason that we can't make sure that folks who care about an issue about a topic have access to data. In fact, they have, we have more capacity to do that now than ever before, not just by democratizing things like the census, but by you know, data.gov making data available, but also making it available in such a way that people can, can play with it themselves and reach their own conclusions. It, given the polarized times that we live in, it seems to me that um, it's worth distinguishing between some of the, the skepticism on the right and the skepticism on the left. And I'll throw this out there in part with an invitation to disagree with my framing of it, but it, it seems to me that there is more hostility to the idea of experts uh, and science on the right. Um, I would argue that the problem, the hostility on the right is worse than it is on the left. But I think there is also a problem on the left, which is I think on the left there's this increasing problem of when, when, when someone on the left hears kind of a symbol that, that someone else is not on their team, they tune them out, right? They say that speech is equivalent to violence. Um, I know this has been a big issue on some college campuses. You've mostly escaped it, I think, so far. Um, uh, but the... Uh, but I worry about both of those two halves. I don't mean to equate them, um, but I think that, that sort of solving some of this hostility to knowledge and debate and democratic functioning might require acknowledging that we're not necessarily trying to solve the same problem across left, center, and right. I think that's entirely fair. Um, I think that's entirely fair. And to address the critique of the left, I mean, I'm experiencing it in my, on my Twitter feed today having this week participated in an organization that's trying to, that is unveiled itself as trying to formulate bipartisan, a bipartisan conversation and approaches to access to healthcare. Um, the, the, I get ugly stuff on my Twitter feed from the right, particularly every time I tweet in Spanish, by the way. Uh, but most of the ugliness coming in is from our friends on the left who are not happy that I'm allowing myself to associate with folks who disagree with me on other stuff. And I just don't know how you can expect to have a policy conversation that arrives at results if you're not prepared to even engage in a conversation with people who carry a different view. Now, having said that, I have also participated in you know, pushing back against what passes as expertise when it's, when it's coming from, for, for example, anti-immigrant groups who, who get money from, from uh, white supremacists, for example. 
those are hard tensions, but we have to have some capacity to talk about them. I would just, uh, interestingly, in the examples that you were giving in terms of the right and the left, and this gets back to sort of the first thing of it, do we think the problem is, is that people don't want knowledge or they don't trust the source? And so let's just take an example from the left, vaccinations and uh, the anti-vaccine yeah. kind of uh, folks, which are, tend to be more from the left um, than the right. And do we think it's that these people don't want knowledge or it's that they don't trust the source? And this is why in the first response, this understanding at the root of this, is it about, you know, Cecilia, you said that, you know, there's an aversion to knowledge. Is there an aversion to knowledge or is there an aversion to expertise? And as you were saying, do democratizing information, I think indicates that perhaps there's not an aversion to knowledge necessarily, but it gets to some of the opening remarks about the questions of expertise. And so as we think about that in terms of both the right and the left, is it about where it comes from ha and how it is validated and how we get to that space that can help us move forward? Let's, let's now come away from some of the polarization stuff. That's actually a nice segue to it, which is there are a whole bunch of policy areas that are not polarized, right? I mean, driverless cars are a really good example, right? Dri at least not yet. That is so not far. a polarized issue. There are lots of people who are skeptical of them. There are lots of people who are excited about them. But if you knew how, what someone's attitude was toward driverless cars, unlike so many other issues, you couldn't guess what their opinion was about 10 other different issues. Th th there are many issues like this. We see uh, mayors and governors and people from both parties often trying to implement better policies, whether it's Mitch Daniels in Indiana, Bill Haslam in Tennessee, Gina Raimondo in Rhode Island, Rahm Emanuel in Chicago, the list goes on and on and on, right? And in many cases, these are not obviously partisan issues. How do you think, as people who've served at the highest levels of government, how do you think we are failing to make sure that our policymakers have access to absolutely the best and most relevant knowledge that they could? So I think the question of knowledge for policymaking has a couple different elements to it when you're trying to, to make policy. And one is actual factual analysis in aggregate. And so that's the kind of data that comes from the census, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, from much healthcare data. And so um, there's that piece of it. And then I think there is information that is at the macro level and at the micro level. When you're policy making, you also have to get that information. This is part of the democratization question, and I think part of hearing people's voice uh, in terms of making policy sometimes and how you do that to bring these things together. Uh, it's factual aggregate, factual individual as reported to come together to policy make. And when you're talking about how you um, get all of that to do it, I think one thing that we have to do is we have to stand up and protect the entities that produce this data. Uh, and those are in the government, those are sometimes outside the government, but um, undermining their legitimacy is something that I think is not helpful to policymakers in the long run. I think we also have to encourage policymakers to do that kind of listening. And what was interesting about all of your examples, there was a consistent theme. They were actually all examples of executives. Yes. And I, having been in kind of different roles in different places and having worked with all of those governors, having spent lots of time with Bill Haslam and um, other, uh, all of the folks that you mentioned, what is interesting is their proximity to actually having to execute every day and respond to a group of people, their state, their city, whichever it is, and they actually, in certain ways, I think that's a very important thing because they need the facts and they have to move and move quickly. Every day they're expected, that they are on the line for delivering and they themselves are on the line. And I think that's also uh, part of it, which is creating accountability. Yeah, I would just add to that, that as policymakers, you have to be willing to, um, to explore data and actually find out answers that may not correspond with, with your ideology, right? Or where you thought the policy should be going. Um, to give you an example, the, one of the things I spent time on, that we spent time on, 
in the Obama administration was a policy aimed at um, helping folks who were returning to society from incarceration by this, there was a whole initiative and lots of advocacy around banning the box, right? Asking employers not to ask the question about criminal record to avoid discrimination against people who had a criminal record um, but who had served their time and were ready to re-enter the workforce. There was some suggestion in the middle of that d debate, some evidence came forward that it was possible that banning the box led some employers to discriminate against entire categories of people because they didn't, they couldn't, in their minds they felt they couldn't be sure whether they had the information about whether there were criminal records or not, so they would avoid hiring, for example, African American men. Now however you feel about that, the, the data is important. That's an actual, it's a question we actually don't know the answer to yet, and it's important not to forge ahead with a policy it, it, as a result of ideology or pressure or whatever it is, um, in the absence of information about whether or not your theory of the case is actually true. And being willing to, um, to explore whether or not your theory of the case is true is tr uh, tremendously important if the policy making is gonna be effective. That's about data, ultimately. Can you talk for a minute about the college scorecard? And, uh, cause I think there's a really interesting point to make about it. Yeah, so this is lots, of, I mean, there are lots and lots of stories I could tell about this, but the, so this was a, uh, President Obama was very eager to have an impact on reducing the costs of education, and he reached the conclusion that if people had in, as, at least as much information about what you were getting out of a college education as you have when you are, say, buying a refrigerator, that, that more information could lead to better decision making. This is what kind of information you measure is a hugely controversial subject. I say this as a proud liberal arts, holder of liberal arts degrees, that where it's pretty hard to, to, to quantify their value in economic terms compared to, you know, my brother with the engineering degree. Um, but the goal was to um, make data available so that people could, could look at it and make decisions that were better informed than the decisions you would make just looking at the brochures of the colleges and universities who were marketing to you. The controversial as that assertion is. One of the things we learned was that, so we were gonna produce, what the president asked us to produce was a website. Through the intervention of something called the US Digital Service, which is the um, unit where we essentially recruited lots of hotshots from the Silicon Valley to help us do things better, that crowd taught us that instead of just producing the data and creating a static website, we should um, incorporate user-centered design and actually ask 17-year-olds how they might use this data. The result of that was both a website and an API. We just released the data, and now there are lots of different entities that use it to produce their, their information that's being aimed at students. So as a result, this data is now informing lots of different things that we never envisioned or imagined, and that was because of innovation from some data scientists. But in addition, whether or not students are using it, universities know that the data is being produced, and that seems to be having some, of, some effect as well. That's what I find so interesting, and this is a good place before we open it up to you all to have Sylvia wrap it up for us, because this combines your two great fields. Um, uh, it seems to me the record of getting a lot of this mass information out there and having consumers or citizens use it is, shall we say, mixed, right? People aren't choosing what hospital to go to based on its performance, um, based on the metrics from what we see. And yet, putting the information out there can still have a huge impact, because when the information goes out about how American is doing, you all are looking at it, at American, and you may care how you look. I will never forget the story that a doctor named Bob Wachter told me when um, the federal government started publishing statistics on door to balloon times, about how quickly, basically, ERs were treating cardiac patients. And he said, before we got the data, we thought, we're the University of California at San Francisco. We, of course, are gonna be great at this. And then we got the data, and we were decidedly mediocre. And our first reaction is, the data was wrong. But then we dug into it and we realized, no, we actually were mediocre. And while there was no consumer demand that they fix it, they were embarrassed and they fixed it. And it seems to me that there can sometimes be knock-on effects of data getting out there that isn't as simple as what we've at first imagined it will be. Um, so I think you know, there are two parts to this. And one is when you run and manage complex organizations and big organizations, I mean, that's what you want. 
mean, there's a reason that people use dashboards and that sort of thing. And so, I, you know, I believe that, you know, in an, or any organization I'm in, I want that. I want to know. I want to understand, and I want to understand myself relative to others. I want to know how I'm doing relative to where I've been uh, as an institution. I want to know where I'm going. And so I agree with you that there's value uh, in terms of having the access to information and measurement that's important internally. And I do think externally um, that people do use, and it is important. And it's important both for decision making of individual consumers. It's important for uh, something that Cecilia touched on in terms of that information creates tools. It drives the economy. You know, I would say most of you probably have the weather app uh, on your phone. And when you think about, you know, the National Weather Service and the Department of Commerce freeing that data, and what that led to was the creation, you know, so it, it, there's economic value as well. So I think there are many pieces and parts of this um, that argue for data becoming available more broadly, more widely. Uh, but it needs to be accurate and funded to have the ability, like the census needs to be funded, so that we can get the accurate data. Let's, let's leave time for a couple questions from you all. Please tell us who you are and ask Cecilia or Sylvia a question. I just feel for any secretary who's living with that, uh, just in terms of these are big, uh, large, and important places. And for one to have the ability to do all the kinds of things that we're talking about doing right, which is making sure you have the right analytics and substantive information. I said you also need to listen uh, and understand from, you know, constituents and people to understand what you're doing. And that becomes very hard uh, when you don't have that ability to have a team in place. And so um, I would just say that the outcome of that does make policy making harder. Makes policy making harder, makes implementation hard. Mm -hmm. And you know, implementation isn't just like a theoretical thing. Implementation could be making sure everybody gets a flu shot when you're in the when a, you're in a flu epidemic, for example. Um, that's life or death. That's not it's not an academic question. My name is Joe Freeman. Uh, I know you didn't want to talk about news, but in today's news was a report on how the census is going to be going to define where people live, in particular those on military bases who will be defined as living on their base, and uh, will be counted as living on the ba uh, in the in the area of the base, and prisoners who will not be counted that way. Now, in the case of the former, that's obviously an attempt to increase the number of people living in red states, since military bases are um, heavily found in red states. I'm not sure what it means to not count prisoners, uh, but I would appreciate some um, comment on the use of census to bias political outcomes. Thank you. I worry about this actively every single day as somebody who got my policy training on the basis of that first census which counted my own population meaningfully. Um, it's, this is an, perhaps the nerdiest and wonkiest of policy topics and the, but also the one which really affects everything, everybody in this room, everybody in the country because resources are allocated as a result of the census. Obviously political districts are a portion or, Congressional districts are apportioned because of the census, and it has political implications, all kinds of implications with respect to money, all kinds of impl implications with respect to just knowing who we are, what our educational status is, our health status is, our housing status, all of those things. Um, there is, I, I have yet to fu figure out whether or not there's uh, sufficient funds for the census in this budget deal that's being discussed today uh, in, in Congress, but it's a vital question. There is, the census typically does three end-to-end -end tests uh, before it happens in, uh, you know, every 10 years. O funding has been allocated only for one of those, and it may be a truncated one at that. All, and the census is going to be conducted digitally for the first time ever, which is 
um, a big deal, and we may or may not be ready for it. We don't really know, and that's terrifying. So, and our, uh, I've heard people say, um, you know, what do we really need a census for? I can get any information I need just by Googling it without recognizing that, like, the basis for the stuff that you're Googling, guess where it comes from? So really the ability to make policy on the basis of data starts with the census and starts with these really critical, nerdy, wonky policy questions about how we count people, who we count, what questions we ask, um, and how uh, accurately um, we conduct it, and how, and I think this is a really vital question, how confident Americans feel participating, um, which in this environment I am worried about. Thank you. I'm a member for UNESCO Task Force. And my question is the following. Uh, how, uh, it's based on some experiments we conducted in Scandinavia. How would you relate with your experience and central government level, how can you inform, educate everyone everywhere, especially in rural area and small cities? We have been overwhelmed with feedback we got is from remote rural area, small, medium-sized cities, not to mention capital cities. And we learned a lot. So how to make them participate? So uh, in terms of results and data and information, um, I think one of the things is the, there is an overload of information. We didn't really talk about that in terms of people and knowledge and information that the question is, is how pr people prioritize the information they receive and also how they receive it. And I think as one thinks about what move people move when and how, that you have to think about those kinds of considerations. For example, um, Ebola and Zika are both probably important examples of the need to move information to populations broadly and very quickly. And in a situation like that, determining what are the key, you have to limit it to the key elements. So we couldn't go into all the details of, uh, in Zika, because it's a complicated, um, in Ebola too. But you had to figure out what are the three most important things that are the critical path issues, and then figure out for those particular things, what were the channels. And what happens in the world we live in today is I think you just have to know, communication is gonna be complex, it's gonna be multi-channel. Um, you know, we used community public health centers, we used nursing associations, we used all of the trade associations, we used public health, we used it at the community level, we used it at the state level, we used social media, we used influentials. And so, first, what is it? How do you get it to the, the bite size that you think? And then the second, what channels for the issue that it is and for most effective? I mean, I spent, in terms of talking to people about healthcare that are 18 to 34, I went to a lot of beauty salons. I spent a lot of time with DJs. I learned about gaming. Um, and that's because that's the means by which one needed to communicate with that population. And Cecilia, a great partner in this, did a lot of Spanish media in terms of did it in a language that people could relate and hear from. And Secretary Vilsack did a lot of rural radio, lots and lots and lots of rural radio. Last question. Hi, thank you all. I'm Sonia Sarkar. I'm a public interest technology fellow here at New America. And I was really interested when it comes to knowledge and expertise in this tension you were talking about between policy and politics. And Cecilia, you mentioned the causation theory behind the black box policy. And I was wondering if either of you could just speak to some tangible examples of when an unintended consequence of a potential policy was uncovered and there might have been resistance from people who wanted to be able to claim that policy victory, um, either for political reasons or for the policy reasons, and how you were able to overcome that resistance to actually, rather than have paralysis around the decision or around implementation, move forward. In some ways, ban the box was my was my best example um, of one where we really thought, you know, one policy was the right thing to do, and and now there's plenty of room to question whether it's the right thing to do. Having the courage to actually say to folks who were pushing in one direction or another, 
look, let's follow where the data leads. I mean, I guess another example is um, we did, in the Obama administration, we did the first ever HIV and AIDS action plan. It was a five-year action plan, and then there was a second one um, to, to make sure that we were thinking over a longer time horizon. And part of what was essential to that was actually insisting that the decisions that we would be making about where to allocate funds would be actually driven by data. At that time, there was a lot of pressure to invest in particular communities in particular regions of the country for good reasons. Um, but ultimately, having that plan in place allowed us to say, look, here's the data. It's public. Everybody can look at it. And we're going to make these decisions, which may or, you know, which in some cases were um, kind of going against the political currents. But we had a basis for doing it. The basis was driven by the science, and it allows you to withstand political currents that otherwise would be really hard to navigate. Do you have an example? Uh, sure. It, you know, everything from, let's just go back to when the loan was given to Mexico. Uh, and, you know, it was a question of Mexico uh, being able to survive. This is in the 1990s. And at the point in time, there was supposed to be legislation that was when I was in the Clinton administration. We were working together with Trent Lott and Newt Gingrich, um, the leaders, um, because they were controlling the House and Senate, and they were the leaders. And they came and were honest and said, we don't have the votes. And that was the plan to, to do it. And so coming up with another approach and a plan, and part of the reason they didn't have the votes, the day that the administration announced its decision that we would provide a loan through various sources to um, the Mexicans, it was printed in the Wall Street Journal that there was 80% opposition to that as a nation. And you know, in the end, uh, the American government made money uh, on the effort. Probably many of you won't know that point or fact. You'll remember it and probably even remember it negatively. But I think that gets to the fundamentals of a different conversation, which is about leadership uh, and when you have these decisions that are tough and looking at the ramifications of not taking the actions that, you know, substance drives you to take. Um, but that's a part of, of what you do and that's a very big one. But those kinds of things are every day when you sit in the seats uh, and you're in the seats of execution. Because the question about the census is a, an execution question, really. I mean, it's a policy question, but when you're at that level, it is an execution question. Thank you both. I think we need to yield these chairs to other folks. Andres. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. And thank you, Sylvia and Cecilia. That was a fantastic conversation. David, we'll let you get back to your sl slow news cycle. Thank you for joining us. Um, and just to show how nimble we are here at Future Tense, there was a great question about the census. So in our next conversation, we are slotting in the former director of the Census Bureau. That's, that's how nimble we are here. Uh, but to introduce that conversation, I want to call up our next moderator, uh, my good friend Ari Ratner. Um, Ari is the founder and CEO of Inside Revolution. He was also a, he's an alum here. He was a fellow in the class of 2014, and he came to New America after a stint at the State Department where he was working very closely on this issue of bridging government and, and the tech sector. So Ari, I, I will let you take it from here. Um, can everyone hear me? Is this on? Uh, so first of all, thank you for the kind introduction. Well, it's also um, uh, an honor and a privilege to follow in the seat of David Leonhardt, who's uh, a personal idol in many respects, which I think is something that can only be said in Washington and New York. But um, uh, I, I don't have a long introduction prepared. I, I, I think my co-panelists, uh, uh, Lorelai Kelly, Kenneth uh, Priet, and Travis Moore should uh, should join on the stage, but uh, we're going to have a, um, uh, a treat in many respects because we have uh, two experts on Congress, um, which is, has a knowledge deficit in many respects, or an expertise deficit, uh, and an expert uh, on the census, former director of the census. Um, uh, and we're going to speak about uh, um, how government uh, can keep up uh, in, uh, increase its knowledge infrastructure and keep up with other sectors of society, like the private sector, um, where knowledge is just much stronger. So. I'd invite my panelists to join me on stage. And I'll, I'll take the opportunity to ask the first question to Kenneth, um, which is, you know, we had a discussion about the census in the last panel. Um, uh, 
you know, in an era of big data, when Google or Facebook or Amazon uh, know more about any of us than we'd like the government to know, uh, or that we'd probably allow the government to know, um, and they know it not on a every 10-year basis, but on every moment-by-moment -moment basis, um, what is the role of the census? How can it utilize the private sector? How can it keep up with the private sector? Um, uh, how should it change? I mean, this was once a and still is a, a vast scientific, demographic, and, and physical undertaking. Um, uh, now many things can be done by computer. So I'll start with the uh, phrase, uninformed democracy. I hope everyone presumes that's an oxymoron. Uh, it, an uninformed democracy cannot function as a democracy. Um, therefore, uh, a democracy has to have an information platform and it has to be shared because if everyone doesn't work off the same information platform uh, uh, holding constant the need for security of certain kinds of things on how many terrorists there are in the country and so forth but nevertheless fundamentally if the information platform is not shared then you cannot have a robust discussion about uh, uh, what's going up and what's going down. I mean, uh, the, the information platform in part is a huge source of trend lines. Uh, and trend lines are actually how we think about public policy. Uh, school dropouts, uh, abortion, uh, uh, educated population, unemployment, uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, how many people are online and, and, and using Google and so forth. Um, trend lines are a critical component of actually a functioning democracy. But that means an information platform that has a baseline and therefore you can measure things that are improving or not improving because you hold uh, the government to account for, uh, for what's not improving, or you should, uh, if it's a functioning democracy, uh, and reward those who are making the trend lines go up or down depending on which direction makes the most uh, sense for both the economy and the polity and the society. So um, how do we get an informed, informed democracy um, Thomas Jefferson is responsible for two pieces of it, which is the census. He was the first census director. Um, that's a that's slight exaggeration. There was no census bureau. You just kind of went out and did it. But, uh, 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 the uh, uh, federal marshals actually conducted the, the early censuses. Um, but also the first big map maker, uh, Lewis and Clark, uh, as, as was mentioned this morning about uh, uh, earlier in this day. Um, so you need that, you simply, if you don't know the map of your country, but that's both a, a physical map, uh, where are the borders and so forth and so on, and you don't have a demographic ma map of the country, you can hardly govern it, and it can hardly speak back. After all, a healthy census is voice. It is the American people speaking back, and has already been mentioned about trust. If you don't, if the American people do not have trust in the census, either in, in the holding confidentiality uh, clauses in, in place, then you're, you're in deep trouble. There is no census if people don't fill in the, fill, fill in the form and send it back and so forth uh, for all practical purposes. Now, I'm going to um, quickly get to your question. Uh, 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 I just sort of set it up. Um, for, since 1790 to about 1840, the census is what I would call a one-player game. The government did it. Starting in about 1840, the census began to cooperate with the academic community. What I mean by the academic community in 1840 was race science. And a question got put on the census form in 1840 about race at the, at the express request of race scientists. And a different one was put on in 1850, again at the express request. But that was a partnership, if you will, between the private sector and the public sector. Now that partnership with the academic community got more and more robust, and indeed even dislodged race science to a degree um, uh, by the end of that century and became even healthier across the 20th century. So we have a very, very critically important interaction between collecting statistical data about this population. Now, when I say the census, that's a shorthand for the federal statistical system, which has 15 major agencies in it, uh, health, uh, justice, education, uh, agriculture, and so forth, as well as another seven, 70 to 80 uh, statistical programs inside of agencies, which aren't 
inside of their embedded someplace else, like the Veterans Affairs has its own data collection and so forth and so on. So I mean, it's a big operation, a data collection by the federal government. So I say the census is shorthand for that much, much more elaborate uh, thing. So, um, so between 1840 and today, there has been an enormously active, constructive interaction between the academic community, that is a certain form of expertise, about how to do it, what questions to ask, how to interpret them, how to write them up, and so forth. I do think that the 20, not this census, we will talk about this census if you insist, um, but, uh, and there's much to be said about it, uh, but I'm gonna leap ahead of it, uh, leap over it uh, momentarily and simply say the 2030 census. Uh, I believe the 2030 census, I just said this is a quip, and it's a very, very bold thing to say. Um, I actually think the 2030 census will be more unlike the 2020 census than the 2020 census is to the 1790 census. There's that big of a transformation in store for us, and I believe that that transformation will, uh, in very large part, require the census to be a three-player census and the third player will be the private sector, it will be the IT industry, it will be everything from uh, your visa data to uh, Amazon, uh, to Uber, to Google, and so forth. Putting that all together is a big complicated thing and I don't, don't uh, pass over that uh, as if it's a, oh well, why not? Um, it'll take some hard work, but I do think that the next census, the next decadal census in 2030, will have witnessed a fundamental transformation because of the IT. Uh, a transformation we've already gone through as a society. And I think it has the potential to be a much more powerful information base, both in terms of, of the things that matter, demographic resolution, people like granularity, how many you know, really want to get down and talk about particular groups, not just Hispanics, but parts of the Hispanic population or parts of the Asian population, put them together if you're worried about health conditions and so forth and so on, and then look at their simultaneous uh, uh, experience. Um, and, and, uh, and uh, demographic and geographic resolution, of course, uh, granularity, we call it, uh, down to as small a space as, as possible. Enormous issues about privacy, enormous issues about confidentiality, enormous issues about accuracy, uh, and I don't mean to minimize those at all, but that's the future I see going forward, a fundamentally new information platform for our democracy, because we do not want an uninformed democracy, but the next stage of informing our democracy will involve a, a, a transformation of the federal statistical system. Uh, let, let me ask a follow-up to Travis, uh, and then we'll go to Lorelei. Um, to have the type of transformation that Kenneth is talking about, um, in many respects, you need to bring government up to speed, not only Congress, but the executive branch uh, in terms of the type of things that are known and easily understood where you live in the San Francisco Bay Area. You know, one of the things that strikes you um, if you work in the federal government is there's a big generation gap. Um, the federal workforce tends to be, um, well, composed of many, many wonderful people, uh, in part because of the difficulty of, of hiring, um, hiring freezes over the last decade, tends to be older than um, certainly the tech workforce or the workforce as a whole. Um, so how can we take the talent um, that exists in places like the Bay Area, that knowledge, and bring it into government. As a related question, how can we do that um, and are trying to apply that to the legislative context? And so we have fellows, um, so we place technologists to work in Congress through our Congressional Innovation Fellowship. Fellows work on everything from autonomous vehicle regs to surveillance reform. Um, we give them a year on the Hill, um, and some of them want to stay, uh, but some of them don't. Um, but it's important to provide that pathway um, and provide the opportunity to serve. And that, that doesn't exist right now. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's not just Silicon Valley, but it's also, there's, a, there's, the, there's the demand side of government, but there's also the supply side of people coming out of CS or engineering or informatics degrees. Um, and some of those folks want to work in policy, but they don't have a way to do so. So I was up at MIT this fall and talking to um, the director at CSAIL up there, the Computer Science and AI Lab. He said, listen, uh, it's not a majority of my students, it's not even a big minority, but five or 10% want to work on policy. I have nowhere to send them. And so part of what we need to be doing is connecting the supply side to the demand side. And um, you know, our fellowship, I think, is, is one way to do that. And to, to your point about being captured by industry, I mean, that's one reason that we're trying to work with academics. We're launching an extension of our program trying to recruit PhDs and master's students right now. Um, to start the summer, 
um, academics are, are, not, are non ideological and they're coming from an information um, space. So I think, I think connecting those supply and demand sides, not just with industry but with academia, is super important. Um, and let, let me ask Lorelei on, on Congress in particular. Um, you know, how, how do you see the knowledge infrastructure there? Um, how, how might it change in 2018 f where, for good or bad, many members of Congress are retiring, so there's kind of uh, a loss of institutional knowledge, and how does it compare to the other branches of government? Sure, thanks, actually. I wanted to out-nerd everyone with a slide. I don't know, can you? Okay, it's not a Tesla in space. Um, I hate to disappoint. <laughs> so Congress, um, the replenishing the knowledge and expertise inside Congress is, uh, has been my sort of obsession. I came to DC in the late 90s actually to inventory the damage done by something called the Contract with America, uh, which was a, a turnover in the leadership of Congress where there were real intentional um, uh, demolition of some of the in-house resident expert knowledge. This uh, is <laughs> the legislative status steps of Congress. And the reason I'm showing you this is because everybody likes to point to that uh, Schoolhouse Rock video from 1975 about the life of a bill and how it is generated by a community meeting and the member of Congress is there in person and then goes and a lot of, if you'll notice and go back and watch it, a lot of the time is spent in committee. <laughs> and then it comes out the other side as a law. Um, well, right now, Congress is working with 45% less expert capacity in-house than it had in the 70s when that video was made. And the committees themselves are convening about 50% of the time. What that does fundamentally is erode the, the sort of um, democratic sharing of knowledge from the public and citizens back to the institution itself. So the question I'd like to, uh, to pose to the audience, because we're, we're all going to have to figure out sort of what is... Uh, the new division of labor in a democracy for the 21st century. Um, in the introduction, we heard about this idea of, of trusted public entities like museums, uh, like land grant and public universities, cooperative extension programs. We have a knowledge grid in this country that is fine. Museums, they should be the information intermediaries for policy purposes. Because right now, I think, um, as much as we need technical upgrades, we also need a change of heart uh, in this country. Um, anger is not a sustainable emotion for living, much less for governing. And we have to move past that into this um, idea of sharing and, and dare I say, institutional empathy. Um, Congress is, uh, is always the bad guy. But what I'd ask you to do is separate uh, personalities and headlines from um, the institution itself, which is really a very durable and participatory mechanism for democratizing knowledge in the 21st century. My uh, feedback from, and I've talked to hundreds of staff, and right now my project is how to crowdsource expert capacity uh, for Congress, uh, in Congress, in districts. So I go out of DC and I'm in districts now talking to members uh, about what they need and who they trust. Um, there's going to be a role for technology and data in this, but there's nothing that's going to just replace the gut check of who's talking to you, who do they know, what network do they come from, how timely is the information, are they a constituent or not. And I would just uh, point out that every step on this uh, needs a different kind of knowledge from a different kind of uh, time and place. Uh, and the other argument I would make on behalf of the institution is we're going to have to um, have some compromises and negotiation on the level of transparency that's going to be allowed uh, in, the, in the legislative process. Um, Congress is, is fragile in certain ways right now. As for institutional memory, I did a quick uh, average on the back of a napkin, <laughs> and we're going to lose 700 years of institutional memory in 2018. That's huge. And we can talk in the Q&A about what citizens can do about that, but we're going to need to surge into that memory vacuum, which didn't happen in the 90s. And I think that's one of the reasons we've gone from sort of issue capture in this country to process capture. It's not going to work and it's not sustainable. And the only thing that I think is going to be able to fix this problem is um, a real love for the institutions and a going back to basics and rebuilding the shared knowledge system that was eliminated over the last 20 years. 
let me ask a question for all the panelists, and, and we can take this in whatever way you want. But the, the title of the panel is Can Government Co Keep Up? Um, to some extent, uh, to me, uh, the question is, do we want government to keep up in this sense? Our government is designed deliberately um, to be fractious, uh, uh, to be a, a slower institution where things can be considered carefully, uh, albeit that's not always the case in practice, at least in theory, where power is uh, split among different branches and within branches themselves. Um, yet the speed of society and the speed of technology um, is unlike anything government is designed to be built for. So there ought to be an interplay on where can government keep, um, increase its speed to keep up with particularly new types of technologies coming down the pipeline, AI or blockchain or whatever the case is, but where does government have the responsibility to slow the technology or to be, if not to slow the technology itself, to be a institution that deals with um, uh, a lot of the longer term effects of, of this kind of increased speed? I can give you an example from rural Arkansas and rural New Mexico, where I'm from. Uh, you know, uh, Wi-Fi is defeated by a rainstorm and a tin roof in parts of the country that are rural. I was just home for Christmas, and my mom was in the Four Corners where I uh, grew up, and it took three hours to watch an hour and a half movie um, on Wi-Fi. <laughs> so the fact that we don't have a conversation right now that is uh, a premise that uh, access to a digital knowledge network that is shared is the very first step. It's primary. We can't have anything else unless, much less a blockchain, which is a, a lovely idea for Estonia. Um, it's not going to work in the United States until we are, we're all online equally. It's, again, 21st century democracy. That's the first step. Access to the conversation itself. One thing I'd add, I, I think what we, in terms of keeping government up to speed, one thing our, our fellows serve to do is help government, help Congress, help members know what they don't know. And so we're at a place right now, Congress has 12,000 staff. I found five that have any formal technical training. It's now seven because two of our fellows wow. have gotten hired. Congress does not know what it, what it doesn't know. Here's, the, here's a great example. One of our fellows, in all of the investigations into Russian interference in the election, um, no one had thought to reach out to the voting machine manufacturers to understand their cybersecurity practices. Um, that's a pretty big gap. And so one of our fellows launched an investigation into, you know, wrote a letter. Um, what, are, what are your security practices? Have you, have you seen interference? Um, so we need to at least get to a place where government knows what it doesn't know. It's a complicated question, uh, an important question. Uh, I think uh, checks and balances, deliberation are critical, of course. Uh, you want a thoughtful democracy, not just uh, you know, uh, rapid democracy. Um, on the other hand, uh, since the rest of the, a lot of activities are moving very, very fast, including obviously the IT industry and so forth, um, and, and, and what, what's the, going to be the role of AI a decade from now? Uh, how many things are going to be decided by algorithms as against people sitting around a table arguing about them and so forth? So I, I simply think the government cannot not speed up with respect to its information platform. That doesn't mean it has to speed up with respect to its deliberation and certainly does not have to speed up with respect to the importance of checks and balances and, and so forth. But if the information platform is kind of always out of date, and, and my answer on that is that the decadal census that apportions the population can safely go to every 10 years as it has been. Uh, you can wait that long for population shifts to decide which gets to, you know, you're, you're only moving a, a very small number of seats after any given census anyway. It's not something that dramatic, although it matters. However, the other data sets, the, the, the American Community Survey, uh, health statistics, employment statistics, and so forth. If, if you have to wait four, five, six, seven years for question answers to, the, the, to a policy issue that is rooted in that data set, that's just too long. Uh, uh, and so I, I think you cannot, I don't want to be Pollyannish about this, but I do think you, I, te technically we can speed up. And so when Congress is having a discussion uh, about financial policy, everybody 
and, and somebody says, well, I, you know, I was told the last time I got a haircut by my barber that he's pulled out of the stock market, and what's that mean? And then you're going to punch a button, and these many barbers pulled out of the, you know, in the last 24 hours. You know, I mean, that, you, you simply got to force into the system the capacity to painlessly get access to granular data where it matters. Um, and then I think you change the nature of the delivery process. You don't have to, you can still say it's going to take us a long time to figure out whether No Child Left Behind is really working the way we thought it was working. It took, it took a number of years. We had actually destroyed an awful lot of, you know, of our public education system in the process, but we did, we did figure it out. Teach to the test was an enormously damaging thing to our public education system, but we had to, we had to watch that unfold. But not to know what's happening and not to know what's unfolding uh, is, is just a, a, a huge, you know, the military wouldn't tolerate uh, waiting around to sort of figure out uh, how well its weapons are going to work and what kinds of weapons it's going to need and so forth. And we simply cannot let that be true in domestic policy either. Yeah, and I, I note the military, um, I worked at the State Department, but dealt a lot with the military. Um, uh, you know, Moore's Law is, I think, 18 months, and the military procurement um, processes, well, it's not, it's not 18 months. Uh, and I know Secretary Carter in particular spent a lot of time in the Valley speeding up that and developing labs within the military. And it seems to me some of what goes on in the military in that sense, that, that expeditionary nature of seeking knowledge, um, ought to occur uh, in the rest of the government. And it's not the question the rest of the government doesn't want to do it. The rest of the government doesn't have the, the power or funding or capacity to do that. Oh, I might push back on that. I, I think that there, there is, the, if you, I've been to a Defense Innovation Board meeting. It is an incredible set of, of experts. And um, there's, there's political will from the top to do that. I mean, Ash Carter and, and Jim Natas have, have made that a priority. Part of this is prioritizing, investing in learning and investing in an in institution itself. And until we as citizens hold our institutions to account to do that, um, it, it may not happen. Defense is, you know, defense is, everybody can rally around defense, but it, it's, it's an incredible set of people that they have working on. I would also just add that, um, just to uh, build on what Travis just said, like right now knowledge doesn't have a competitive political constituency. Um, it doesn't uh, compete with uh, what I like to call the talking points industrial complex. Um, there's a lot of money in this town that scales anger and malevolence. And now we've got foreign actors involved. And we need to see our democracy as a defense issue. If you look in the world, and I study other parliamentary systems and legislative assemblies, some of the most advanced digital democracies are Taiwan and Estonia. Um, why? Because they've got big, um, scary neighbors breathing down their necks. And they've, they look at the, their grid you know, in Estonia has been taken down by Russia in 2007. So they see this as this is critical infrastructure of democracy. And in our country, it's more complicated because there's nothing as powerful as the U.S. Congress. The U.S. Congress is the, it, it's, it's a unique creature in the world of representative assemblies. It's the most wealthy, it's the most uh, pot potentially participatory. It's not a parliamentary system. I would argue that uh, having a, this sort of a top-down system forced onto it is one of the reasons it's shutting down. But um, all of these communities, certainly I was a national security staff person on, on the Hill for almost a decade. Um, the people I needed to show up at the right time and place never were there. They would be sending me a, um, they would be sending me a 400 page dissertation on a nuclear disposition or, and the other side was uh, showing me a video of protesters chaining themselves to a reactor and, and so we've got this chance now to make the operational level of knowledge very effective and to have a, a curated sort of method that's going to happen in communities and states. It's, lo it's local. Where are the surge teams that match members' committee assignments, for example? Where are the process facilitators? They're doing this in, in the Nordic countries. People with process skills, we need them desperately right now because the t town hall model is not only obsolete, members are being shot at. We've lost two in eight years. Two members of Congress have been shot at and terribly wounded in public. That's a game changer for an open system. It's a game changer for democracy. So all these people that have all these special skills in this sort of new 
broadly conceived vision of labor for uh, the 21st century, um, we need them to show up and, and sort of inventory their own skills differently, but, but also understand that uh, it's not a lack of information for policymakers. It's a curated, very, you know, that mimics and, and produces information that's for the purposes of this, and a lot of it's going to happen outside of this process, I would argue, on the top before things are introduced in the formative process of ideas and sharing. Uh, l let me ask one final question to the panel before we open to, to questions from the audience, um, which is, uh, as several people said, there's, there's not necessarily a constituency for this issue as important as it is, and we're stuck in the governing environment for better or for worse that we are um, with the existing, um, uh, well, uh, plus polarization and all that. Um, what are the one thing um, that, you know, people in this audience can or ought to push, whether it's their members of Congress or in any other way, uh, to push this issue or to become involved in this issue? What are, what are practical steps people can take? I wrote down a couple. Um, everybody in this room is probably from somewhere else and not DC. Um, so I would start there with your family and friends and just a couple of things that members and staff have told me themselves that they would love is uh, know your member, not just uh, um, sort of what their major issues are again, that's coming directly from the party usually and that information is coming from donors. Uh, but what does your member love? And give them a chance to talk about the stuff that, uh, that they don't get to do in Congress. Because Congress as an institution is quite anti-democratic in its processes now. Members don't get to participate in their own workflow in a meaningful way. People talk about regular order. It's going to be a huge change when we have a, a turnover where most um, staff and members don't have a memory of the deliberative process itself. One of the things I looked at is, is um, something called docket days as an example. Instead of a town hall, have a, have a day that the community organizes that lets the member come and talk about a piece of legislation he or she introduced but never went anywhere, that was stuck in committee. Let that member talk about what they love because that builds a relationship and it lets the member be a leader in a way that they're not getting to on Capitol Hill when you're only getting to do 50% of your hearings when most rules are closed. I mean, look at the bills in the last six months. The uh, no open deliberation, hardly any hearings. At least there was a conference committee on the tax bill. Uh, that's, um, that's atrocious for a country that considers itself the world's leading democracy. But I would also argue that the trust deficit is two ways. Everybody, you know, doesn't like Congress, but there's a lot of reasons why members of Congress don't trust um, the public, look at a Facebook page on any member's Facebook page and look at their inability to have a meaningful discourse in the comment section. That's sad that because those are the platforms people are using. So become a trusted, authenticated curator in your district. That's one uh, suggestion. Another one is micromedia press lists. Organize yourselves in your communities around your members' institutional responsibilities. Those are committee assignments, again surge capacity in, in a crisis. Let them go somewhere else besides the political parties and Fox and MSNBC, or increasingly now even further extreme talking points that have very loud constituencies. So self-organizing knowledge in districts to me is the most important thing and making yourself visible in a new way. I, one thing I say to our fellows We've got one in the back here, um, Tabuki, who, who's uh, um, going to be starting next week on the Hill, um, is if you work on the issues that are already polarized, we will have failed you. Um, net neutrality, really important issue. It's not going to, a fellow's not going to make an impact on that. I think that's true of constituents as well. Um, find the issues, especially if they relate to a member's um, committee. Members really want to do good work for their constituencies. Um, but you have to find the issues that, that aren't, it's not tax reform, it's not Russia, it's not health care. 
there are really important issues that members want to work on, and they're always looking for ideas, um, but they can't be the polarized one. So I would, I would, to Lorelai's point, think about the issues that matter, but that aren't polarized, and that are important to your community, and then ask for a meeting. Members of Congress will most will usually take it um, if you're meeting with them in district or, or DC. This has been very well said, and, and, and I'm, I'm with experts on the congressional process, so I'm not going to try to add to that. I would say that one of the themes that comes through to me in this conversation is, um, is curation. Uh, it's a different word from expertise. Uh, we know experts really know some things that uh, the rest of us don't know. Pilot knows how to take, you know, so forth and so on. Uh, and we're glad uh, if we fly. Um, and, uh, but curation is something we can all do, uh, which is as best we can in conversations with whomever, but including our congressmen and the staff and, and each other and citizens and school teachers and so forth and so on, is just try to help people think through, well, this sort it through and figure out what is sound and what isn't sound, irrespective of the, the directionality of it from a partisan point of view. Just, I would just sort of say, let's just have sound knowledge. Uh, and then let the chips fall where they may. Uh, I think the, the unsoundness of what goes out there now uh, is pushed out there is, is, is a huge, huge threat to our democracy. Obviously, I'm sure the next panel will talk about that as well. Um, and we don't have time to go on to it now, but, but curation is a different responsibility, and all of us can somehow play that role if we ourselves are informed, and, and so that's step one and step two is try to get other people informed by dealing with knowledge which has some sort of roots uh, that, are, that, are, that are trustworthy. Okay, wonderful. We're, we're gonna open up for questions. Uh, when I worked in the uh, Obama campaign in 2008, I noticed the president did uh, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. So we're gonna adopt that, except we're gonna go uh, ladies first. <clears throat> My name is Deborah Lathan. Hi, Lorelei. Uh, my question is this, and it's a bit of an observation as well. I noticed that one gentleman stated that back in 1840 they put on the census, census the question of race. And I would assume that that might relate to the fact that at that time slaves were counted as one quarter of a person in order to benefit the southern states so they could have more votes. Now today we look at the census, and my question really goes to how do we keep government from using technology in illicit ways? So when I think about the census, this new census, people might get excited because it's going to be, you know, it's technological. You're going to be able to do it with the internet. But millions and millions and millions of Americans do not have access to broadband. They are in rural communities, they are in minority communities, and the app that's being set up for the census is one that works best on a computer, not on mobile. Most lower income people don't have computers and access to broadband at home they have a mobile device. It will be very difficult for them to be counted. And on top of that, there is a new question, sort of similar to the race question of 1840, and that question is they're now asking citizenship. So that could certainly have a very chilling impact on the Hispanic community. So my question is, yes, technology can be good, but how do we harness it in the hands of our government to not use it in a political manner that is oppressive to minorities and others. There are two dimensions of that, one of which is the citizenship question. Um, uh, although at a different level, you may not pick this up yet, but it's even worse than asking the question uh, in terms of the quality of the census this time. Um, uh, historically, we've always allowed non-citizens to be enumerators. They live in neighborhoods, they speak the language, they are trusted, and uh, the words now come out that, we, that the Census Bureau will not be able to use uh, non-citizens to uh, conduct the census in, in 2000. Um, I can only say this is not the Census Bureau speaking. The Census Bureau does not want that citizenship question. They're fighting it all day long, every day. There's a network out there that's fighting it. Uh, it has not happened. It's been proposed. But we have to see if we're able to fight that back. We know it will damage the census in major ways. We just we have evidence to that. It's not just made up. We really know what will happen in terms of drop off. Your more general question, of course, is is equally important, uh, which is about who, who's not on the grid. Uh, the Census Bureau has one rule only: count everyone only once in the right place. Everyone, 
every resident of this country on April 1st year ending in zero. And they, they only care about getting as close as possible to that accomplishment, that very simple accomplishment, um, uh, as they can. And I promise you, there's going to be technological census in part. We have to see how well it's worked. We don't know how well it's going to work. Uh, it's also going to be administrative record census. Uh, at least 20 or 30 percent of the population probably this year will be counted in 2000, will be counted out of administrative records um, uh, that have been put together in health and, and education and IRS and so forth and so on in order to locate people. They will not stop with that. They will knock on the doors of those communities if they get funded. <laughs> As of now, we have to wait and see on that. But, but uh, the census is enormously underfunded. It doesn't have a full-time director. All kinds of things I could say about the current census and, uh, and the details. But I can promise you the Census Bureau itself is deeply, deeply committed to a quality piece of work. And they will fight. They will fight in the halls of Congress. They will fight in the halls of, of the White House as best they can. They are finally a federal agency which takes its guidance from the Secretary of Commerce. Um, and in turn, uh, he takes guidance, guidance uh, reports to the president. So I, I can't tell you for sure what's going to play out. But, but don't imagine that the Census Bureau itself is not aware of who's not on the grid and how you count them and include them and so forth. It really does want to count everyone, uh, whatever their language is, whatever, uh, by the way, including, of course, the non-documented. We did a very good job counting the non-documented in 2000, the census I was connected to, because the Catholic Church helped us enormously. And they were the trusted voice that went into those communities that it's really important. I just, one more thing about the census, then I'll, I'll quit. Um, you've got to appreciate that the fundamental census number structures every piece of survey research of any kind by the federal agencies or by the private sector, by the pollsters, for the next 10 years. That is, sorry, I got to come in. Okay, all the, okay. Then I'll. I'll yeah. Okay. Anyway, the, uh, every day, every every survey that is conducted over the next ten years after the two thousand will be off the degree to which that census is off. So if you've undercounted California and overcounted Wyoming, that will be true for everything that happens that uses numbers. And the number, by the way, was mentioned this morning, a very large number of dollars at stake in the census. Six trillion between 2010, uh, 2020 and 2030. Six trillion dollars will be allocated on the basis of census numbers and they will be allocated in terms of where people got counted. And if you don't count people, that neighborhood isn't going to get any uh, uh, money or that city or that township or, or whatever. So the stakes are enormously high. Do we, have, do we have time for one quick question? One quick to this gentleman right here. My name is Eddie Eiches, and I spent the last, more than half of the, my last 30 years in federal government as a union president for federal workers. And I have a di completely different take on your can government keep up with technology. Specifically, we used to have permanent government employees who were at the top of their uh, top of the game in, in IT, and especially I, it began probably in the early 90s. But with the uh, Gore's reinventing government, a lot of them lost their jobs. They were bought out, and then we had contractors who had different set of loyalties working with the uh, federal employees. And now it's much much worse, especially in domestic agencies. You just don't find any programmers or people who really understand the IT. So. We need to bring back the positions, and of course, we also need to, to uh, bring back the incentives for federal to work in the federal workforce and make it a career that is getting at least on a theoretical level the best and the brightest, as opposed to having like four different versions of FERS, uh, making it more and more unlikely that uh, presidential management interns will ever stay beyond a certain period of time. I would just say, you're right, we have to stop, stop harming ourselves. I mean, something that everybody can do is, if you hear someone trash-talking government, ask them to also say something good about it. And we all benefit from this system. Yes, it has its flaws. Um, but I, as a, a staff person on the Hill, also um, saw the privatization of expertise. The privatization of knowledge um, is a terrible dilemma. 
and the business plan of this city, a large part of it is built on that. Yeah, well, well said. Um, so that is uh, the second panel. We're, we're going to thank our current panels. Thank you. Uh, and we're uh, going to invite back up Sheila and Arthur for uh, uh, a final panel. We're even going to get rid of the extra seat. Thank you. Um, so everyone has the formal titles um, uh, on the on the piece of paper, but um, we're lucky to have two uh, tremendous experts on um, uh, really the discovery of invention, innovation, knowledge, science uh, with us to, to round out the uh, the program. Um, our final topic is called uh, the challenge of democratizing expertise. So I wanted to open with a question that's more of an observation, which is, um, I think one of the challenges with democratizing expertise is what you might call the sociology of expertise. Um, if you look at it, uh, and I'm a communications professional now, expertise is often used not to connect with people, to, but to cut off. Um, we give people fancy titles, doctor, professor, on and on. Uh, we literally place them on a stage with people lower than them, opposing them, who have to ask questions in formal ways. Uh, we use jargon to distinguish ourselves. Um, how do we, uh, Sheila brought up in, in the first comment that people were right to question um, experts in, in part because of the failures of, of recent experts, but how does, uh, am I being fair? How does that sociology contribute to, to the dislike or the lack of democratization of expertise and what can we do about that? Great question. Um, I mean, let me come at it from two angles. The first is, if you look at people who have written on the sociology of expertise, they actually were incredibly enthusiastic when in the 1980s, 90s, a series of studies began that began to look at citizen science, at the way in which lay people actually gather data and use it. There was some early work on the way in which people who are especially passionate about birding were in fact playing con major contributing roles in studies, uh, ecology, environment, around bird migration, because there's no way for the experts to be everywhere, and there's actually a great amount of data collection that people who are excited about this can contribute. And so you had kind of systems develop to actually draw that data in. Now what's interesting, so yeah, the people in sociology of science were very excited to see this, because one of their criticisms for a long time was very much this sharp division because when you look really carefully at what experts do, if you really peel it apart, right, it's day-to-day -day work processes that other people can readily learn and do. It takes some time, perhaps, but there's not actually some genetic predisposition to become an expert. There's no wall that's insurmountable. Now, what's interesting, I've looked at in carefully, for example, at randomized control trials, the ways in which we decide pharmaceuticals are safe and efficacious. And there's another example of an area where a group of concerted activists um, around HIV AIDS in the 1980s challenged the regulatory system and said, we actually need to get drugs before you've run the full clinical trial. And I won't say this was an easy adjustment, but the system did adjust. The FDA did make it possible to kind of accept new kinds of information into what counts as a definition of safety and efficacy to soften that boundary between testing and market so that people could get medicines. We've gone to a far extreme on that now. There are people who claim that any drug that's been invented, they, if they have a life-threatening disease, have a constitutional right to take that drug. And so now you've actually challenged the basis of knowledge because you're not going to be able to run effective clinical trials if the manufacturer is somehow obligated to provide the drug to anyone with that disease. And so it's very interesting to see where this kind of spectrum lies. Um, and so, yeah, back to your point, I, I don't think there's something particularly special about expertise beyond a particular focus and many years spent on it. And people engage in it at many levels. Um, so, uh, again, all right, thanks for the question. Um, one of the 
responses is if you're going to cite sociology, you've got to get sociological all the way down or all the way across in some sense. Most people, when they go into their doctor's office, uh, look at the certifications on the wall or they look at what the hospital's record is and yeah, I mean, there's, so there are many places where we, as citizens operating in society, make judgments about relative degrees of expertise or not. So if those degrees didn't exist, uh, if uh, there weren't a way of classifying um, the value of training, uh, Arthur's talking about how long someone has been in business, if you want to go to a surgeon, uh, you typically want to find out how many of those kinds of operations that surgeon has done. So there are lots of places where actually there's separation of people into categories that some people know more than others uh, is something we rely on, that we go back to that. And, and I think that, uh, you know, Ken was talking earlier about uh, uninformed democracies. I suspect that democracies with no hierarchy totally flat democracies in which everybody is expected to know the same as everybody else uh, would not be feasible anyway. There was this thing called modernity that brought in uh, systems of specialization and, you know, I give my students a very simple heuristic. I mean, they cross streets all the time. In Cambridge, Mass, they do it illegally most of the time. But in any case, uh, uh, there are these countdown uh, monitors now at traffic lights and you know the one near my intersection and nearest my office there's 19 seconds and you know we rely on those things that crossed one right here coming to new america i mean if it says 10 seconds you kind of accept that it's 10 seconds but how many of us bother to think where those seconds came from who did the traffic modeling that led to the particular set of seconds and you know you go to the supermarket and you buy milk and you see non-fat or one percent or two percent we're not carrying out our monitoring exercises. We're depending all the time on you know, somebody to have known, somebody to have certified, and so on and so forth. And we'd be up the creek if we really wanted to be responsible all the way down for every piece of information. So you know, I think that one should displace the question and really get to the sociology of trust rather than the sociology of expertise. And for that, I think one would need to have kind of deep knowledge about why we place trust in one thing over another. So circling back to the first panel, I think that there was a missing piece. There was an indication in what David Leonhardt said about the right and the left and polarization. And of course, polarization is a really problematic thing in the, in the country now, but it's also important to recognize that there are places where the right and the left come together in a sense, that there is a left critique of expertise that is about illegitimacy that is not dissimilar to the right critique of expertise. It's just that which experts are considered illegitimate may vary depending on the issue. But if there's a fundamental agreement on certain things, like overclaiming is a bad thing, or experts straying out of the domain in which they're certified into sideways domains, or money can distort regardless whether it's coming from a government agency or from a corporation and we need to understand whether money is doing that distorting or not. Those are levels at which I think right and left could begin to talk together to restore some of this missing trust that I think is quite foundational to the sociology of knowledge. I view it my job to kick off the conversation. I see you nodding, so I can continue. Uh, I, I was agreeing with that, uh, so. Um, well then, then let me ask a follow-on question. Um, uh, I, I certainly agree with you on, on the level of, you know, it, it just would be impossible to live in a world without expertise and without hierarchy. And to some extent, it, it seems to me on information, we've almost mirrored the problem of the food industry in a way. We've gone from an environment in food of scarcity to now the question is abundance and uh, obesity. And information, quite similar. We've gone from a world where there was lack of information to one where everyone is nonstop bombarded by information and you get the equivalent of junk food, you know, fake news, all, all this, and the things that are good for you are not tasty, um, uh, both in information and, and in food. How, how do we, um, uh, for lack of a better word, um, how do we curate expertise um, uh, better for citizens or how do they curate it for themselves? Um, how do we think of a world um, where there is so much knowledge and so much expertise 
uh, out there that it's impossible to tell what is in fact truly expert. Yes, yeah, so I think that there are certain kinds of um, things that people can be taught about expertise that are really the same things that they should be taught about democracy, that, that uh, there are certain baseline questions you might ask about, you know, is this something that multiple eyes have looked at or only one set of eyes have looked at? On the whole, we tend to trust things that have been looked at by more than one person. We can name it something fancy and call it peer review, but it's really like two sets of eyes are better than one. And we believe that all the time about all kinds of things. I mean, why do we get second opinions before undergoing an expensive piece of surgery? And, and you know, so those kinds of things are to some degree commonsensical, but we've elevated expertise to such a level uh, as uh, an icon. And, you know, the kind of environment I work in is as guilty of doing that as any, that we forget that there are rather commonsensical normative ideas here, moral ideas, ethical commitments by which we do that kind of curating anyway. Um, a second set of things I think came out of that first set of discussions. I mean, I, I was really taken with that idea of the, um, you know, not checking the box about the previous incarceration status. So I think as a very general proposition we've learned over the years that for somebody to make the judgment that they should withhold information from the public at large doesn't usually work. And misjudges the intelligence of the people. I mean, so th that particular policy uh, took one piece of information and said, it is too dangerous to let the public understand this. Now, if in the same, in the same audience we said, well, look, the GM companies are not wanting the GMO label to be put on food, you would probably get a very different right-left packaging around that, but you'd get the, but it's the same set of nerves that are jangled. Why should somebody be making that judgment, a curation judgment, that we don't deserve to be told this information, because we're not mature enough or adult enough to deal with that. I think that this trust business has to be mutual and flow two ways, that if you want trust in government, government has to trust back in some sense. Now, that should not be a mindless trust. It has to go with education and information in a certain sense. You have to give criteria of analysis and judgment. But I think that on the whole, an idea of curation that says, I make the choice for you what information I'm going to give you, that doesn't work in all sorts of other places, especially not today when people have so many subsidiary ways of finding out information. So one could go down the line. I mean, one can sort of lay out the sort of dangers of curation. And the other thing that came up was in the context of weather and how people have taken the weather data and done all kinds of things. You find that all the time. If it's a productive data set, you don't, you the first source, don't have to worry about the curation all the way down. People are entrepreneurial. They'll find uses. They will curate for particular communities and make sense of the information in particular ways. So in that sense, you spur creativity in the society. Be open and let people have at it with the information, and they will do their own curating for whatever those purposes are. Admittedly, we need feedback. We can come back and say, is that for the good or for the bad? But that's a separate, further on down the line issue. And you know, the amazing thing is a lot of that is happening. So there's been this anxiety around a decline in deference to expertise forever, basically. But any particular area you scratch carefully, historically, you'll find a lot of contestation, a lot of questions, a, a lot of threats to the institutions that are supposed to be guarding and making decisions in processes that are both transparent, fair, and democratic. So each policy area you look at carefully, you see that happening over and over. But a particular concern from the 70s on, right? Americans no longer trust experts. A huge one in the 70s around nuclear power. The tons of contestation and question, why don't Americans trust in nuclear power the way they should because we know as experts it's safe. So that's been an ongoing process and as Sheila's pointing to, what has been changing, it's always interesting to see what's different versus what's quite constant. What's been changing is the generation of more information that people tinker with, that they do things with. So you look at chemical data. So information about chemicals in the environment and in our bodies. So tons of tests have been done. 
that generate this information at incredibly low cost. You can find out the 150 synthetic compounds that are in your body right now that didn't exist before 1910 because they hadn't been synthesized yet. But what do you do with that information? Well, it turns out there's a ton of environmental NGOs who will tinker with it and begin to inform you. Now, they may take you down a very a path that not everyone will agree with. They may lead you to conclude that, um, and there's a website I can show you, that orange juice is a chemical shit show, as it says on that <laughs> website. Well, that's absurd, mostly. It's a bunch of enzymes that have been added to increase the flavor and give the umami scents out of orange juice as well that probably aren't, in fact, harming your body. But, you know, there's a lot of this play going on, and you can actually now also use QR codes and find out ingredients in things you want to buy that there certainly was no way of doing 10 or 20 years ago. So we do see this broadening of access, and it leads to a counter push, I would say, of concern from the side of either industry or government, these institutions who say, well, if this continues down this path, no one will trust anything, no one will buy anything, people will go crazy. If you want to test every chemical produced to the degree we test pharmaceuticals, you're going to have to pay for a plastic container what you pay for a prescription drug. So we end up having to make some of these choices around safety that then relate right back to our institutional basis for making decisions and drawing on expertise. Wonderful. Um, let me make this observation, ask, ask a question. Um, there's undoubtedly a, a skepticism of expertise around the country. There's also a particular skepticism of this town. Um, and there's, this, to some degree, I think there's a conflation between the skepticism of expertise, which is a, a broader phenomenon, and the skepticism of Washington. Uh, some of Washington is an expert. Um, what would this, I know New America has a, an effort to, to go into the rest of the country, so to speak. What would this conversation look like, not in Washington? And I say this as a graduate of the Kennedy School, that Cambridge doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure Cambridge is the right place to go for your answer anyway. Um, one of the kinds of things I do is look across countries. Uh, this is not the only democracy. and. It's quite striking that, for instance, the paralyzing debates we've had about abortion don't exist pretty much anywhere else. You know, even Ireland is about to have a referendum, right? Um, so uh, climate change, the same sort of thing. It's not that you can't find climate skeptics all over Western Europe, but on the whole, it hasn't fed into a paralytic politics of how do you respond. So why is that? I mean, what what is it? That, I mean, it does kind of mark us as special in some way among democracies. And, and I think that um, one can plausibly argue that many other um, democratic systems have worked out ways of combining the politics and the specialized knowledge in ways that we have actually not done. I mean, so as a very heterogeneous, very decentralized, diverse society, we've actually raised knowledge to a kind of pinnacle that the knowledge can't sustain. I mean, we've made it truth or bust. And, you know, most of the time, public knowledge is not in either the truth category or the dead-end category. It's somewhere in between. Um, we have said that uh, we don't negotiate on knowledge. It's either true or untrue, and a lot of the time. I mean, you know, the climate change advocates uh, are not saying, look, there are weaknesses in what we know, but nevertheless, the best consensus possible is this, and here are some persuasive reasons why this is the best consensus possible. For whatever reason, and you know, we could talk about this in much greater detail than we have, have time for, other countries have been able to construct those things. So I think that the failure of expertise and the failure of democracy are happening side by side, hand in hand in this country. We're not going to repair one without the other. We've got to repair both. So let me add a slightly different angle to this, um, not disagreeing with what was just said, but we have been talking this entire uh, afternoon about a particular kind of knowledge, which is a real abstract scientific knowledge. And it gets very messy if you go into what's, what's a technical knowledge, what's a making knowledge, what's a mechanical knowledge because I don't want to claim these as absolute categories, 
But one thing that clearly the United States has been a global leader in is in enabling tinkerers, makers. We've had the rise of a maker movement across the country. We have people across the country who now see themselves as inventors in a very similar model to the late 19th century when we had an incredible diversity of invention. Um, we haven't given people the same resources. Women and minorities do not patent at the same rates as white men, and there's now a great deal of attention to that. And that absence of that isn't really racism at the USPTO, and it isn't that the market cares a lot about who the inventor was in terms of their skin color or gender when they're buying consumer products. It's that the ideas don't get a chance to manifest physically and be turned into that, so more resources need to go to that to support it. But there is, in fact, a huge amount of activity and churn around mechanical knowledge, even as everything seems to be digital and abstract. And so it's just a striking observation that um, other countries are actively aiming to copy that, what we've got going here in the US. Um, and I haven't figured out the connect between that mechanical, the making movement, and our politics around invention and innovation. That's a wonderful observation. Even a lot of the culture is around, I mean, if you think of the hipster movement, around the, the physical um, object, uh, which is interesting. Um, so we're going to open up to questions. Um, uh, I think I'm on uh, uh, lady, if any lady wants to, you are both gentlemen. Any ladies? Otherwise, we'll going once, going twice. OK, we'll go to that gentleman in the back. Hi, I'm uh, Dan Stern with the Housing Assistance Council. I was uh, I've just been sort of thinking this over my head that one of the gaps that I see is that while there is a uh, while, while there's sort of a skepticism about big data, there's also a, sort of an over reliance on it. And I I anticipate that if we don't invest more in our data collection activity, people are going to see those gaps more and more. So I wanted to know what you guys thought about sort of future investment in data. If that's not clear, I can expand. But I, for example, my boss is always very skeptical that a, there's not a national study on rural workforce housing <laughs> or something like, something that's a very niche issue that no one would have studied without a huge infusion of money. But he's skeptical because he thinks there's big data everywhere. So how do you overcome that sort of gap of people, people are being told there's all this information out there, but it's not as targeted as they may think. And how do, how do you get that across to policymakers, let's say? So, I mean, that's been a longstanding issue in America. We, you know, the origin of the National Academies, the National Research Council were very much around, well, we need to provide targeted focused studies that provide answers to policy because as we fund you know, science and technology and engineering across the board, we're not actually doing that to answer policy questions. We tend to fund that based on what's the most interesting research questions in that particular subcategory of scientific work. And that's been the strength of the peer review system of national funding for science through NIH, NSF, and others. Um, but it then also has never been answering like that the question that somebody wants on the Hill about a particular piece of legislation. And I don't think simply having data answers questions. It may give you an additional resource if you frame your question properly and have the people to do the work. But absolutely, I'm with you. You're going to have to have focused studies every time. And you really need to spend time knowing what question you're asking and why. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. And, you know, data covers such a multitude of territory. I mean, everything we're doing at this moment could turn into data. I mean, the sort of modulation of my voice up and down could be recorded as data and it could be used for speech recognition purposes or whatever. So we do need to make choices. We do need to decide what's important and what's unimportant. And the census discussion we had in the last panel was indicative of that. I mean, so. 
the decadal sensor serves one set of purposes, but the fact that it needs to achieve a certain degree of robustness and then the granularity doesn't necessarily come from only that, but other things. I think as a very broad general proposition, people are not going to collect information unless they think it's important. But again, a kind of saving grace is that there are lots and lots of major actors in society capable of gathering information. Uh, and so when a uh, focus of worth, this is something we want to know something about, emerges, people do jump on it. So the whole citizen science movement in many places has been driven by a sense that the official data collection sources were not collecting the right kinds of information. And then there are partnerings that also happen between citizens saying we want information about this and then collection agencies that are, are capable of doing that. It all goes back to sort of the aware democracy point. You know, what does our democracy need to know? Well, before that, I mean, you know, what does our democracy think it needs to do together? What is that collective enterprise? If we sort those things out, then I think a lot of the data questions become almost secondary to that. They follow as corollaries from the first set of things. Yes, yeah, so I think, you know, we would both share the, the view that the data isn't going to provide the answers and that the more data we generate isn't going to get us closer to where we want to go. We have to have the right questions and the right research approach. And we'll always end up with gaps that people will notice and say, well, that isn't reflecting my lived experience. You have an abstraction. You have a clinical trial. You have this large-end data. But actually, here's something that happened to me that matters a lot and that I would like the policy apparatus to respond to also. Uh, so I think we have time for just one last question. Um, uh, anyone? anyone? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, I have very happy experience with Smithsonian and UNESCO project. Uh, my question is, uh, we talk about uh, expertise, democratization, and so on. Uh, have you been involved in rebuilding communities, cultural heritage, natural heritage, and engage them, and how to engage them, whether war zones or just undeveloped area or even United States, I think. Have you been involved to combine such an expertise to uh, engage them in innovation, social innovation? So yeah. you, I know you have unique competence and content research, so thank you. So let me, let me give a short answer. I mean, Smithsonian is an enormous institution that has done all kinds of initiatives on that front. Um, the Lemelson Center that I'm the director of operates something called Spark Lab, which is a hands-on invention space for kids, especially in the age 6 to 12, that really intends to ins motivate them, challenge them, and get them to see themselves as inventors. And we've built out a national network of sites in museums around the country and what's been really interesting is in these communities, seeing how they take what we, what we offer them, tweak it, modify it, and adjust it for their own community. How they bring in local inventors to talk to kids in the space, how they feature a different set of invention challenges that they know will resonate with that community. So one challenge, clean plastic out of the ocean. Well, in some communities, it was clean plastic out of a lake or clean plastic out of a river. That's sort of a silly example, but you begin to see how you can calibrate what we think about into that local that then kids absolutely grab onto. So, I mean, that's a very small example out of the areas of Smithsonian. Um, well, your question was really directed to <laughs> museums, but of course universities are in the business of creating and, and uh, informing communities as well. And, and I'm going back to the point that Arthur made before about how in a society that prizes invention and rewards it so much, there are gender gaps and ethnicity gaps. Uh, so what does one do with something like that? And you know, I think that that again comes back to how different networks of institutions work together to bridge those ideas. One of the thoughts I had was that the spheres of activity in which women often find themselves often involve a great deal of innovation, like the kitchen, for instance, but major chefs tend to be men. And 
you know, is there something going on about the sort of nature of the innovation and what's rewarded? And in any case, you don't get patents for recipes very easily. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a question of what kinds of work we're valorizing and where we're seeing invention as a phenomenon and what we're rewarding. Um, I'll just finish with the fact that, you know, we don't treat someone like Rowling as an innovator or an inventor, but arguably she did more to transform the imagination of an entire generation on you know what's possible and what's thinkable uh, than Steve Jobs did. But you know we have to sort of encourage the capabilities and on a variety of of levels. Wonderful. Um, so unfortunately we have to wrap it up, but I want to thank both our uh, panels um, and also thank the audience. I certainly learned a lot. I'm really looking forward to the 2030 census after th that discussion. And thank you, Sheila, for helping us pull this all together. So, thanks.